This is episode number 58, featuring watercolor master Mary Deloitte Arndt. Welcome to the Plein Air Podcast from Plein Air Magazine. I'm your host, Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. In the Plein Air Podcast, we dive deeply into the world of outdoor painting. We call it Plein Air Painting, for those of you who don't know. Plein Air is a French term essentially meaning in the open air or outdoors. The French call it Plein Air. Others say Plain Air, but no matter how you say it, there's a huge movement of artists around the world going outdoors to paint. I call it the new golf. It's a lot of fun. The podcast is brought to you by our newest painter's retreat, Painting Cuba. Yep, we did a historic trip there last year with 100 painters, and we managed to get permission one more time to come on in. We were historic before. This is going to be a group of 50 painters. It's half as many as we could take before. And we're staying together in Old Havana. We're going to paint there almost every day. Plus, we're going to visit the Soroy paintings at the museum and the Hemingway House. And it's beautiful. Great food. Cuban culture is amazing. People are wonderful. It's lots of fun. Dancing in the streets. It's all about painting daily with friends, making new friends, and lots and lots of paintable subjects. You can learn more at Painting cuba.com and i think it's almost over half sold out so you want to get that it's coming up in march it is my desire to see more people fall in love with plein air painting you can help by sharing this podcast with your friends on social media or email and i hope you'll subscribe on itunes so it comes automatically to every week and if you have feedback just email me eric at plenairmagazine.com The interview is brought to you by the Plein Air Convention, which is going to be in Santa Fe this April. Last year, we had almost 1,000 people and a lot of people who showed up and never painted before because of you listening to this podcast. So thank you for coming. Uh, We have lots of professionals, lots of semi-professionals, lots of people who just love to paint and some newbies. We have a pre-convention workshop. If you're brand new, you want to go to the pre-convention workshop, which takes you A to Z through Plein Air Painting. We also have a workshop this year with the amazing Kevin McPherson, and that's the day before the conference. So you want to sign up for one or, you can't do both, one of those, and come to the Plein Air Convention. It's amazing. We're going to have about 80 top master artists leading the way. We have uh, watercolor, pastel, uh, some acrylic. We have a demo stage with lots and lots of demos, and we have another main stage doing oils and also lots and lots of demos. Some of the most amazing painters in the world are going to be there. It's historic. You can learn more at the Plein Air Convention website, plenairconvention.com. Well, let's get right to our interview. This is going to be great with Mary Deloitte Arndt. Well, I am really honored today. I have Mary Deloitte Arndt on the phone. Mary, do you remember when when you and I first met? Oh, yes. Tell me about that. (laughs) That was in um, Tahoe, Lake Tahoe. That's right. And the Plain Air Painters of America were very fortunate to be able to have a uh, show there uh, because the manager, I guess he was, of uh, Caesar's Palace loved Plain Air. And I think he was a student of one of the members. And so he arranged for the uh, Plain Air Painters of America, which were probably, uh, I don't know, I think they were about maybe 28 or 30 of us, I don't know what it was, to come there for a week and stay at Caesar's Palace and uh, paint and have a show at the end of the Right, that was, uh, that was Mark, right? It was March? Mark, the manager was Mark. Oh, Mark, yes, yes, yes it was Mark. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, I, and you may or may not remember this, but um, when I saw your, saw your paintings, I had a very, very peculiar response. Do you remember what it was? <laughs> peculiar? Well, I know you said, you said to me, I don't really like watercolor, but <laughs> there's something, <laughs> I think you said luminous about yours. Or something to that effect. Well, uh, this could have been taken as an insult, but it certainly wasn't meant that way. I, <laughs> I, I, no, I took it as a compliment. You know, and I don't. I, I remember saying that um, 
I, I, did, I couldn't believe that your paintings were watercolors because I thought they were oils. Uh, and I had never uh -huh. seen a watercolor painter who painted with such richness and such um, of, of an oil-like feel using the watercolor medium. Well, at that point, I had changed over from painting on paper because of all my trips going to places for painting where you have to take your frames and all these oil painters with their little frames already and all they had to do was snap in their canvas. I had to think about mats and plexiglass and all this other stuff. Would the mats going to fit with the plexiglass and the plexiglass not have scratches on it and and, and all the frames and everything. It was such a pain. And so I finally decided I have to do something where I can frame like an oil. So I started painting on 100% rag board. And uh, then I didn't have to take all the mats and the plexiglass and all that. I could frame it like an oil, and I just spray it with a uh, uh, an acrylic spray so that it's protected, and uh, that just simplified everything for traveling and packing and everything. So uh, I realized that there are a lot of people who just can't accept the fact that watercolors aren't under glass. That's the old way that it should be presented. But uh, I'm... I also had a gallery at the time that said, I can't sell watercolors because there's a reflection all the time, and the people don't want to spend the money for non-reflecting glass. So it was a, an answer to prayer of uh, what I could do to make the paintings easier for traveling and also for people to enjoy them without having them under glass. Well, it, 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 it worked. It worked very effectively. Are you still doing that? Uh, well, I'm not painting near as much as I was because I've, <laughs> I've lost my big studio. We we moved to a, a small condo, and so I don't have my big studio, and I don't have the energy to go out and paint on location. And I, but I do do a few little things, you know, small paintings and such. Well, I think for the for the benefit of our listeners, uh, is it okay to share with them uh, what year you were born? Nineteen twenty. Nineteen twenty-seven. Is that right? Yep, March tenth, nineteen twenty-seven, Independence, Missouri. Right. Is that right? Right. I sang in the choir with Margaret Truman. Did you really? <laughs> <laughs> when I was young, yeah. So you have spent um, a lifetime as a painter, and you yeah. started at what age? Uh, well, I got turned. I found out I was an artist when I was in fourth grade. Uh, How did you find never, out? <laughs> well, I uh, one of the, we were studying China, and I painted a a map of China and put in the rice fields and the uh, Ginny rickshaws and the pagodas and all that sort of thing on the map. And my teacher was so excited about it, she took it to the principal's office and they pinned it up on the, in the school hall. And I thought, oh, gee, I'm, I'm pretty good at it. I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> And that's when I decided that that was my that was going to be my talent. And so, what happened from that point forward? You know, fourth grade to ninety years old. We've got a we're going to be on the phone here for about uh, sixteen know. hours. How many hours have you got? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, oh, I think but... I think I'd like to touch on a couple of highlights, um, and and then I, I want to go into. Uh, some things that, that you and I kind of talked about uh, when we were preparing for this um, that relates to um, uncontrollable circumstances, because I think there's a lot to be learned there. But uh, mm -hmm. give, give me a couple highlights of how you got from uh, discovering you were an artist to actually becoming an artist, a professional artist. Well, I, uh, 
I just had a love of artists growing up, and my mother and encouraged me very much. And uh, when I went off to college, I decided I was I was going to major in art. And in those days, you couldn't get a degree in fine art. You had to get a degree in art history. And so I was required to do a lot of studies on art history. And we had to make notebooks. We had to do overlays that showed where the center of interest was, how the artist leads the viewer through the painting, how he keeps you from going off the painting. And and I didn't realize that I was learning really composition right. all those years and that it was going to be very useful later on in life. But, um, so... And I, so I majored in art in college, and my father was so upset. He was so sure I'd never be able to make a living with, with painting. But we lived in Can, or just outside of Kansas City, and that's where Hallmark Cards are. So after graduating uh, from uh, a girls' college, I went to work for Hallmark Cards, and I remember coming, my, my father was waiting for me in the parking lot, and I came down, he said, well, did you get a job? And I said, yes. Oh, well, what are they going to pay you? Oh, well, is it three, is it $200 a month? No. Is it going to be 250 No. We went, <laughs> got up, I started at $330 a month. And he was so excited that I was going to be able to make a living at it that he <laughs> um, was very happy. But anyway, that was the years, 11 years of really training in drawing and observing. And I was doing uh, color sep separation work at that time, which now is all done by camera. But back then it was all hand painted. And I didn't realized then too that uh, God had a plan. Not only had I learned the art history and composition in college, but now I was going to learn how to actually draw and observe and values. And so I did that and then I worked there for 11 years and all this time I really wasn't painting at home at all or doing any kind of original artwork on my own uh -huh. and uh, then uh, <clears throat> I moved from Kansas City, uh, Kansas City we moved to Phoenix Arizona when, when you say we you mean your parents or uh, my hu my husband and I yeah. okay and and I had one little girl and we moved to Phoenix and um, uh, so that was when I got interested in the local art organizations and going to galleries and seeing other people's work and thinking, I want to get into fine art. What year would that have been? Uh, that was in uh, 1960, 1961. 61. And here. so was, was uh, Phoenix or Scottsdale the art community that it is today? Yes, yes, it was. So you, not not as many galleries, but there there was one very good gallery here, and I used to go visit, and I got to know some of the artists, and uh, then I started painting in oils. I started taking oil painting classes, and I worked in oils for about well, I took lessons for about five years, off and on, with different instructors. From some of them would come from other states, you know. And then some that lived in in the area. So and, was the uh, uh, Scottsdale Artist School around back then? No, no, no that that hadn't that hadn't happened yet. But the organization that started it was here. I was a member of the organization that started it, the Scottsdale Artist League. They were the founders. And. Uh, Anyway, then I found that uh, I was left alone with two little girls to support, and I... Wait, wait, what? wait, wait. You, I, I, you were left alone with two little girls to support? Yeah, my husband decided that pastures were greener on the other side of the fence. I see. And so I, uh, 
had two little girls to support. I used to have a pity party every night, feeling sorry for myself. Now, what am I going to do? How am I going to support myself with my, you know, I don't know how to do anything, and there aren't any people where I can do freelance artwork, and besides, that's not very permanent. And um, so one night I was having a pity party, and uh, this man I felt like was walked in, put his arms on the uh, the arms of the chair, put his face up right close to me and said, you can sit here and have a pity party and ruin your life and ruin the life of those two little girls in the back bedroom, or you can get up off your fanny and use the talents I've given you. And at that moment, I became so joyous and so happy I thought I can teach oil painting I can have oil painting classes so I turned my master bedroom into a studio and started teaching oils Wow! and so I did that and then there came a point with being in a we didn't know back then about having ventilation you know and if you're in a classroom with about Ten people all painting in oils, and we only had turpentine then as a medium. They didn't have turpenoids yet or things like that. So the, the fumes were pretty involved, and I found I was losing my voice. And that's when I thought, I'm going to switch to watercolor. So I switched over to watercolor, found some friends some uh, that were, who were in the organization that I had met, and uh, started painting in watercolors. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know anything about plein air. Here I had a, a degree in art history and had no idea, I'd never heard the term plein air. I you and me both. <laughs> it took me <laughs> really? a long time to discover it. It, it never yeah. never came across the transom. And, and so how, how did the, the uh, plein air thing happen for you? How did you end up? Because you became very active in all of that. Yeah, well, uh, while I was a part of these organizations, I decided to start planning uh, trips for uh, uh, painting out. And I would figure one paint out trip every month. And one time we decided we were going to go to Catalina. So we would leave on a Thursday and come back on a Sunday, and we would go over there and paint. And so I took a group of artists over, and I'm out painting when here's the mystery and the impossibility, the impossible thing that happened. Uh, Denise Burns, who lived there, who I had never met, did not know, came by and was watching me and came up and said, I'm starting a group called the plain air group and uh, we meet once a year and you come over you pay your own passage and your own uh, your transportation and your own uh, food but we will furnish a place for you to stay and you come over and you paint for a week and at the end of the week we have a show and so I she said it's going to be plain air painters and I didn't want her to know that I didn't know what in the heck she was talking about (laughs) but I was painting out on location, so I was, you know, she had invited me. So I came the first year, which was their second year of starting this organization, and my and I came the second year they had the show, and that show just developed into the most wonderful. Uh, I wish you, you were, had been around and could have come to those shows. They were so fantastic. You well, I, I was uh, pleased to have been to one of the last great shows. I didn't get in early oh, enough, uh, but I went to the uh, the Catalina show. Uh, that was the year of the fires in L.A., uh, one of the years of fires in L.A. And remember, everybody was doing very smoky paintings. And, um, <laughs> really? and, and I brought... I brought my newborn triplets with me in the triplet stroller. That was so that had to be oh. fifteen fifteen years ago. And uh I remember uh the casino had this massive amount of people, uh they wouldn't let them in, and the minute they kinda shot the gun, everybody yes. ran up and 
it was a frenzy, a buying frenzy. I think I remember that they they did three hundred thousand dollars in sales that weekend, and it was just a phenomenon. And it's amazing to me that uh, that what Denise created, because uh, Denise and I met the same time you and I met at the same event at the Planner oh. Painters in Tahoe and uh, had a delightful conversation with her. And, and you really think about the impact that she made and, and quite frankly, the oh, impact that yeah. you made uh, because uh, you guys were the beginning of the, the U.S. plein air movement. There were clearly some people who were outdoors painting, but not, not orchestrated. And right. I took my cue... Uh, I had gone to a Plein Air Painters of America event in Connecticut when I first learned about Plein Air Painting, and I uh, I saw that there were you know maybe 100 150 people there, and I thought this was a movement, and that's why I started the magazine because I was already in the oh. publishing business. And was it's that be- a Plein Air show? Was that a Plein Air of America? The y- Connecticut yes. show? Yeah, you, it was Plein Air Painters of America, and it was done in Old Lyme. And oh, yeah. I, I know they're doing a similar event again, um, I think very, very soon, or maybe by the time this is played, it's already gone. They're doing it in Wembley Island. But it, it's yeah. it, but the Plein Air Painters of America deserve credit because they are really the ones who, who, um, who launched mm-hmm. this movement in America. Obviously, there were Plein Air Painters around before, but this was the first orchestrated movement. And, of course, it's blossomed now into probably a couple hundred thousand people painting outdoors as a yeah. hobby and some some who are, are many are doing it professionally I mean, this podcast alone is up to 50 or 60,000 people who listen uh, on a pretty regular basis and so oh. that, and so thank you I think we all owe uh, we all owe you and the other founding members of the Planner Painters of America and of course Denise well when we finally realized that Denise was wearing out having to be in charge of all this for so many years that uh, that we really needed to get organized. Uh, Kevin McPherson was our first president, and uh, I remember him saying, he said, uh, this was when we established the name Plain Air Painters of America, right. and, and uh, hired... Um, uh, Oh, the Susan? editor of South... Uh, Susan McGarry. Edit, Susan McGarry, pardon me. Uh, yeah, to be our uh, executive secretary sort of thing. But anyway, I remember Kevin saying, we may not be the best painters, but we are the plain air painters of America. And I just felt such a relief because I always felt a little bit guilty that we were so darn successful and there were so many other good painters out there who weren't much better than me who weren't members of the organization (laughs) and I thought you know but we were the first group that really made something happen out of that and those shows I every year I paint maybe uh, probably five or six paintings in a week and I almost every year had a sellout. Yeah. And I was, I was uh, well, at that point we had other watercolors, but at the beginning I was the only watercolor artist. And uh, I think we also should pay tribute to Roy Rose, or to um, Roy, yeah, Roy Rose. Roy Rose yeah. Right. Uh, because, oh, yeah. Uh, because of his impact on, on getting, getting the collectors together. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. He was a big force in it, and I'm sure he and Denise had long conversations before, you know, getting this started. And uh, he was behind it all the way and helped and got the collectors there. And, I mean, we were the envy of every artist in the United States because if they heard anything about it, they knew that we were all selling like crazy, which was unheard of. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and we have uh, Kevin McPherson, your first president and the funniest guy on the face of the earth. Uh, oh, yeah. Kevin is going to be doing a pre-convention workshop at our plein air convention in Santa Fe this coming April. Oh, and, of wonderful. course, we'll be on, on the main stage. And and uh, he's a hoot. He's a lot of fun and, and what a, also a fabulous inspiration. And he's done so much for 
plein air painting and for the visibility of plein air painting as well. Oh, yes. Well, let me tell you a funny story about him. He was out there painting this boat. He was painting the harbor, and this one particular boat was his thing, and he got finished and was taking down his French easel, and all of a sudden, boom, this boat blows up. No. Burst into flames. And I don't remember which artist it was, walks by and said, Kevin, you do anything for a sale. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought that was so funny. I yeah. thought I thought you were going to say he pulled out his, his easel again and painted in the flames. <laughs> well, that's a good one, too. <laughs> Oh dear. So you you have the benefit of being 90 years old and have lived a a life as an artist at least from the 1960s forward. I guess really before that but making a living as an artist. And right. uh you have had the benefit of of probably meeting some people who aren't with us anymore or having some stories or some thoughts on just life as a painter. What do you have to share with us? Well, I uh, I have to give my husband an awful lot of credit because uh, he was in the restaurant supply business. And uh, when he retired, I said to him, what you want to do is learn how to make frames. So he taught himself, and he was really great at it. Now, that was that was just a miracle that he would loved to do things with his hands, but he'd never done that before, and he trained himself and became my framer, and he was so good at it that others were having were having him frame for them, too. And so this, obviously, uh, you didn't uh, fill in that part of the story, so at some point you met him and, and uh, got yeah, married. When, when was that? Well, I was after the divorce, and I was still, I was teaching oils, and... Um, uh, when I met him, it was uh, love at first sight, but he had six kids and I had two, so we couldn't figure out how we were going to make this work, but it it did work, so the whole thing was, that was just another miracle that had to be divine intervention, and uh, getting to meet Denise had to have been a complete miracle. Why should she be there? Why should she walk down? Why should I be there that weekend? That had to be a complete miracle. Yeah, well, that was and, transformative in your career, wasn't it? Oh, it, it would, I mean, it, it was the beginning of my career, you know. Uh, but before that, I was selling some. I had a friend, another miracle. I had a friend who had a friend who was going to open a gallery in Scottsdale. And uh, she came to my house to look at my works, and she decided she wanted to represent me. And that was a miracle because, you know, galleries must be swamped with people, artists coming in all the time asking to be represented. And to be represented in Scottsdale on Main Street or Marshall was was a big deal. And she was going to open this gallery, and so I became one of her first artists. And she liked my work so much that she ran full-page ads all the time in Southwest Art Magazine. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> oh, <laughs> laugh, so I know when you're joking. <laughs> anyway. Um, I have to say that, you know, it's just what I have to say. It. I know. It's, it, it, oh, well, it's not, I don't even know if it's still being printed, is it? I don't know. I'm, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. That's terrible. Well, anyway, it was a wonderful magazine. Yes, they are. They the are. Time. I was just, I was just. Yeah, Kidding. but they, she ran my my ads, full page ads of my work, oh, about every other month for years, and so I got to be known through that. Now that that's a miracle. And then uh, the magazine called and wanted to do an article on me. That was in '83, and I thought, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. And that was a miracle. Uh, 
And, of course, getting into the plain air, being a member of that, uh, opens up all kinds of uh, wonderful things that happened to me because I got invitations to come to teach, to do workshops all over the country, and I got invitations to uh, exhibits, plain air exhibits, like at Laguna Beach Museum. And I went there for eight years with their plain air show. And uh, then there was one in La Quinta and Tucson and and workshops in Colorado and Dallas and Texas and uh, New Mexico and California. So all that opened up not for anything I asked for or did. It wasn't anything except being or- orchestrated by uh, a higher being who took care of it for me and made me an artist that I am. And whatever I am, he it was all the credit goes to him. Mary, you you have um, you've encountered a lot of artists in your lifetime. Um, what? artist other than the impact of Denise and Kevin uh, what artist do you think had the most influence on your work Milford Sorns Milford Sorns okay um, do you know his name I he don't was, well he taught until he was a hundred years old and he was a terrific California uh, plein air painter uh, Ask John Stern. He'll know all about him, Milford Sorens, and um, Charles Reed. Mm-hmm. Do you know that name? I do know that name. Um, yeah, and um, let's see, uh, Ed Post, another early plein air painter. Um, all of those workshops were so instrumental in helping me develop and a local artist by the name of Bob Oliver, who you wouldn't know because he wasn't nationally known, but he was a he taught architecture at Arizona Arizona State University, and uh, was a terrific watercolorist, but a wonderful sketcher. And he taught me how to sketch. He taught me the difference between sketching and drawing. What's What's the difference? Well, a drawing is much more detailed and and uh, painstaking, where the sketch has to be quick and done, you know, suggestive of, uh, rather than a complete, definite drawing. Uh, and he had three books out. One was called The Sketch, and one was called The Sketch in Color, and then a third book that was published uh, called the, the Sketch and Color put together, but... Uh, you know, there, there are so many architects who are really good watercolor painters, too. Yeah, I'm, I've, I've recently uh, discovered that. I've, I've met some people that came up to my Fall Color Week event, uh, one in particular who's an architect and does architectural drawings and does beautiful watercolor work. Yeah, they're just, they're exceptional, so, so many of them. So for the people who are listening to this and have not yet dipped in, into plein air painting, uh, what would you tell them are the benefits of going outside? Oh, my goodness. When I was a studio painter, I'd wonder, what in the world what am I going to work on today? And I would look at photographs, and I would try to figure out what to paint. And uh, then I'd try to do something that was just imaginary or what I remembered. And, and it was just... It wasn't the same, and I went out and I started painting on location, and I thought, oh, this this has got to be the closest thing to heaven. You're looking at the subject, and, and you're feeling uh, three-dimensional instead of a flat photograph. You're looking at uh, all the shadows and the colors that are in a shadow uh, that you don't see from a photograph, and it's just... Uh, I mean, any any artist should go out and look and and learn to observe, and see the nuances of, of uh, what you see. And I just used to be so 
uh, excited every time I'd find a, a, a wonderful subject to paint. And I'd say, oh, this is, this is going to be so much fun. And I, and I just dive into it. And all the time I'm saying, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. This is so much fun. This has got to be the closest thing to heaven. <laughs> when that's when everything is working. And the weather is right. And, and uh, your view is great. Uh, it's just, it's just a feeling you can, you can't explain. You get, you just got to get out there and feel it and see it. And it, every time I look at one of my paintings, I I have a story behind it. So I remember the day. I remember how I felt. I remember uh, who came up and talked to me. Uh, you know, it it's uh, it's just so much more real. And I I never knew quite how to express that, but the sometime recently I was reading something by a plein air painter who said it just is so much more honest. And I thought, that's the word, it's honest. When I look at my paintings that are done on location, they're so much more honest than the ones that I've done in the studio. Uh, I just, I, I have a much more emotional feeling about them when I look at them and remember what happened uh, and how I felt and it's just it's just a wonderful feeling as you know you've discovered that I have as a matter of fact I, I wrote something recently about how I don't ever sell my studies I did sell one recently and I'm kind of regretting it um, but this yeah. guy wanted it so badly and and the reason I don't is because, I, you know, if I'm down and, you know, we all get our moments, uh, you know, I'll walk out into my studio. I've got them plastered all over the walls in the studio, and I'll just sit there, and I'll realize how rich my life has become because I'm outdoors painting, and I get to go to all these magnificent places. And like you said, it's it's every single one has a story and a memory uh, you know, a, a deer leaping across or an animal coming up to you or, a, or, right. a, or, or an animal knocking your easel over. You know, there's so many different things. Plein air painting can be a little bit intimidating, and of course it's a lot different than studio painting, and you have to kind of get used to it, and it takes a little time. Right. And yeah. So from the, uh, again, I don't mean to harp on, on, on age, and I don't want to be ageist, I guess is the, the word. It's okay, but, I'm used to it. But the, it, it's a beautiful thing, uh, because you have such a wonderful perspective. And, and I think perhaps, you know, to some of our listeners who who are um, kind of starting out, somebody who's kind of developing their career or maybe kind of midway through their career, or even further along, is is there something that you could some some wisdom perhaps you could impart upon us as some things that now that you are able to look back on your life and your career that might be helpful for us uh, who might be going forward. Well, there's something that I always used to tell my students in a workshop. I said, when you start a painting, just say, this is going to be the best painting I ever did. And start out with confidence and just do it, and it will come. Uh, there's no use starting out by saying, oh, gee, this is going to be too hard. Oh, I can't do this. You start out and try to visualize. I, I have them try to visualize what the finished work is going to look like. And I usually did a very quick sketch just to get the composition in my mind and then start painting. Uh, I very seldom drew on my paper ahead of time unless there was an architectural thing where I had to have perspective or something like that, or I might just suggest a horizon or something but most of the time because that keeps me open and looking and painting what I see rather than getting caught up in what I've drawn uh, 
and I want to be able to make choices as I go along. But self-confidence is, I think, the most important thing to develop because once you get the confidence, it it just comes. You just do it. And you don't stop to think about whether you can do it or not or whether it's going to be good or bad. You just do it. How do you get and there? <laughs> by doing it. <laughs> you just yeah, keep I think doing that's it. I think that's probably that's probably the right answer. Um you you know, I I had I used to beat myself up a lot. I I I remember this guy um Michael Ringer visited me in the Adirondacks. Uh, to take some pictures on the lake and to do some sketches and so on. And I, he he looked at my work, and I was apologizing. Oh, you know, I screwed this yeah. up, or I made yeah. this mess. And, and he, he stopped, and he took me aside, and he said, Eric, stop it. Just stop beating yourself up. He said, everybody has these moments. You know, you have to go through this transition. You have to you, you have to make mistakes. Embrace them. Stop. Right. Just stop. And... Just by him kind of stopping me and beating me up a little bit, it really made a big difference, and I I kind of stopped apologizing. Oh, that is so true. And uh, I want to, if I can find this real quick, I was painting in Maine, and uh, while I was there, I did one of the best paintings I ever did, I painted in Maine of uh, uh, the ocean in Friendship, Maine. But they that's a, a little town known for its uh, sailboats. It's, and while they was there, they had a newspaper out called uh, Sailing. And in it was uh, what to learn when you're learning to sail. And I, when I read it, I thought, that sounds just like when you're learning to paint. And so I'm going to read it to you. But it okay. says, learning to, to, it was for sailing, but I'm going to change it to painting. When you're learning to paint, there are so many demands to learn. Number one, devotion. Number two, dedication. Number three, understanding. Number four, sense of humor, the ability to laugh at yourself and at your mistakes. Number five, patience. Six, knowledge. Seven, confidence. Believe in yourself. Acquire skills by reading, observing, participating, and enjoying. And make it a learning experience. At the end of the day, you cannot honestly say, I learned something, then you either did nothing or you didn't try anything new. And number nine was forget how embarrassing it is to learn from somebody younger than yourself. <laughs> learn to experience the pleasures and the sensations. And in conclusion, when all else fails, think twice, speak once, hang loose, adjust, don't panic. You will be amazed at how much fun you're having. <laughs> I thought that was so neat because that's, it, would, it that's applies perfect. to sailing and painting and marriages, <laughs> all kinds of things. Yeah, it's so true in life. Well, this, yeah. is, this has been fabulous. I want to ask you the tough question. People have been asking me to start asking the tough question again. Oh. Um, so here it is. You have your closest friends, family, your daughters, uh, others around you. You're on your deathbed. You, um, there's no evidence of, of anything that you've done in your life around. Uh, there's, there's nothing that others can learn from unless they hear what you had to say. So you have some truths. You have three truths that you can share with your family members. Uh, it can be truths about life, about painting, about anything. What are those three truths? Oh, my gosh. And no time to think about it first? Well, if I gave you time, it wouldn't be spontaneous, would it? No. <laughs> <laughs> What's the first thing that came okay. to your mind? My first thing came to my mind was 
leave it to God. If he wants you to be famous, you'll be famous. If he doesn't want you to be famous, you won't be famous. So don't worry about it. <laughs> Good advice. Uh, the second one would be count your blessings and be aware of all the magical things that are happening in your life and thank God continually. And maybe a third would be, uh, what would that be? To observe, learn to observe and enjoy what you're looking at. Just more important than anything in your life is giving your life to God. So how... And oh, go ahead. Whatever, whatever, whatever circumstances you're in, just remember that He comes first. So how do okay. you want to be remembered? Well, I hope I'm remembered as a Christian. I hope I remember that I'm that I love my my kids and I love my husband so much, uh, and uh, I hope I was kind and good and did something worthwhile while I was here. And I hope that my art gives people something happy to think about. I hope it's a kind of art that makes people feel good about themselves rather than sad uh, political statements, that sort of thing. So I want my paintings to be remembered as, as uh, happy times and good times and the beauty of the, where we live and what we do. So what are your big goals for the balance of your life? What, are you, what else are you planning to do? What are you hoping to do? What's on your bucket list that hasn't been done yet? I keep a journal, and uh, maybe I'd like to write something that my kids would enjoy reading and it would, and it would uh, help them in their life and I don't know. Those are hard questions to ask without any former <laughs> thinking. Those are things that are hard to be spontaneous about. I think. Well, I think you ought to write about uh, you. You ought to write about lessons learned in painting. I think everybody'd love to have it. Uh, well, I have, I have three books that I've written that have never been, and that were written for workshops about learning. The ones about observing and confidence and turning chaos into something beautiful. And, you uh, send them to me. I'll get them published, and we'll we'll get them out well, there. <laughs> oh, well. Anyway, they were done as as work to give out at workshops when I did. Well, those have got to be uh, gold. They're like gold. If you've got them, hang on to them, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. Mary, this has Hi. been an absolute pleasure. I think that one of those magical moments, uh, one of those divine intervention moments was uh, when I had the opportunity to run into you and to meet you and Denise on the same night in Lake Tahoe when Mark Retorno put that fabulous yeah. uh, group together, uh, the Plein Air Painters, uh, when you had the big show in Tahoe. And um, Do you remember it, the dessert? I do. I remember there was a, uh, it seems like it had chocolate and pallets or something like that. I can't remember exactly. Oh, oh, it was gorgeous. It was little easels with paintings on them, and it was all edible. Oh, that's right. They were just, they were gorgeous. <laughs> I don't know what ever happened to it. I was trying to bring one home, but it probably melted. But probably it, ate it. <laughs> they were outstanding. <laughs> Yeah, they, oh. they they really knew how to how to throw a party. It was really terrific. As a matter of fact, I have um, I think the painting that won best of show at that event was Ray Roberts did a landscape, and um, and I have that painting hanging right here beside my desk. And uh, I got another painting from Kevin McPherson, 
uh, from that show, and I have that hanging here too. Is actually, I think I got three because I got one from Ken Bacchus as well. So, oh, yeah. pretty yeah. big, pretty Ken big. Was uh, a great oh, they were such. I'm, I, I am just uh, floored at the ability of those artists like Matt Smith and Ken and uh, Ken Bacchus and George Strickland and Kevin McPherson. Uh, Jean Legaskic uh, and Jean Perry. I mean, they have such talent. And, and I look at those and I love their paintings and can feel um, uh, such an energy from them that I don't feel from some of the old masters. Yeah, and they're I fabulous. Think there's, there's, they're just as good, if not better, than a lot of the artists that are famous and in museums. You know, you know this, is, this is something that I, I think a lot of people don't realize, is that we right now are part of the largest art movement in the history of painting. And the, there are more plein air painters than there ever have been on Earth. There are more excellent, high-quality painters painting than there ever have been. And those painters yeah. can hold their own against some of the masters of the past. And this oh, is yeah. a very rare and special moment in time. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because I always feel a little guilty when I think, when I go to a museum and I see paintings and I think I'd much rather be looking at some of those plein air painters' work than I look at these. Uh, so I, I, I'm glad to hear you say that. Uh, well, thank you so much for... Um, giving us a little piece of your time today and for inspiring all of us. This has been oh. one of my favorite interviews ever. Oh, thank you. You say that to everybody. No, I don't, actually. <laughs> I've never said it before. <laughs> oh, well, you're, you're a sweetheart, and I just, uh, I just think the miracle that I met you, the miracle that you said, oh, yes, I'll do an article on you, that was a big miracle. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just a series of uh, wonderful things that happened through those years. Well, you know, we had not, I don't think we had even launched Plein Air Magazine. Um, maybe that was the first issue. I, don't, I can't remember, but it was it was uh, all very new at that time. So a lot of, a lot of yeah. water has gone under the dam since then. You remember when I met you the second time? Nope. It was at the Salon Show in Scottsdale. At the Legacy Gallery. Oh, that's right. That's and, uh, right. I came up to you and, and upstairs. I told you, I told. Oh, that's when I came, That's when I came up to you and told you 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 had uh, you had written an article about um, some show I was in. I guess it was about the Lake Tahoe show that was in your next issue or something and you mentioned my name and it was misspelled so I came up to you and I told you how much I enjoyed meeting you and and and, and I appreciated that you wrote up the show but that you misspelled my name oh, of course <laughs> and you apologized all over the place and I said well I think that deserves a, an article don't you now there's the miracle. How did that come out of my mouth? <laughs> my mouth. I have never asked anybody something like that. And you said yes. There's another miracle. <laughs> so anyway, it was uh, that was the second meeting. You know, there's a there's a saying. A friend of mine, uh, the founder of the TED conferences. His name is Richard Saul Werman, and uh, his saying is, "Don't ask, don't get." Right. <laughs> I think that's true. And I guess that's why I got sh the Holy Spirit shoved me and gave me the words and said, do it. Go ahead. Say it. Ask him. <laughs> you know what's going to happen now because of, of you telling everybody this. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> well, you can edit this out. Just take that <laughs> off the tape. <laughs> I'm not editing anything. Forget I, it. I love, I love to help <laughs> artists, and if I can help them in any way, I will. Well, oh, I know. Well, God bless you for all that you're doing for so many artists in the United States. It's unreal. It's unreal. It really is. Like you say, it's just a, 
It's just another miracle. Oh, what, you're so sweet. What's mm -hmm. happening? Mary, thank oh. you for the inspiration. Mm, I hope so. Okay. Well, thanks again to Mary. Mary is just amazing, and at 90, what a great grasp of history. She's so fascinating and such a wonderful painter. Uh, today's podcast was brought to you by the Plein Air Convention in Santa Fe. You can learn more at the Plein Air Convention website, pleinairconvention.com. It's also by paintingcuba.com. You can come paint with us in Cuba. And don't forget, coming up right around the corner in November in Miami is the Figurative Art Convention and Expo. There might be a couple seats left at this moment in time, depending on when you're listening to this. Uh, you can learn more at figurativeartconvention.com with some of the great masters in figurative and portraiture. All right. Well, the plein air movement is red hot, which may be why Plein Air Magazine remains the number one representational art magazine sold nationwide at Barnes & Noble. Drop by, pick one up. Or you can get a subscription for about half of what you'd pay at the newsstand by going to pleinairmagazine.com. Com. Well, this is fun. I guess I shouldn't be singing. Let's do it again sometime, like next week. We'll see you then. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. Remember, it's a big, beautiful world out there, and you need to go paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye.